Okay. All right. Hello. Welcome. Uh, the topic of today's interview is going to be antidepressants and violence. David has kindly agreed to come on again. I've given him about an hour's notice to prepare for this. Uh, so it's kind of an off, off the cuff talk about this. Um, I'm going to introduce myself quickly and then turn it over to David. I mean, with this topic, I mean, there's a lot of people talking about antidepressants and violence and, um, um, it ranges from people who may have the expertise to talk about it to, to those who don't. So a little bit about that, me, um, I'm a drug safety professional. I work in pharmaceutical company overseeing drug safety, I spent a year at the FDA in the division of psychiatry, mainly looking at issues uh, related to psychiatric side effects, a lot of behavioral side effects. I've done analyses that have changed the labeling for drugs, uh, mostly around, you know, things like mania and um, mania and hypomania. Um, and it's been a topic of interest of mine for several years. I work in a clinical practice now. I treat patients who have uh, problems with psychiatric side effects. It's been going on for two to three years now. Uh, I'm going to go turn it over to David now and uh, just give a kind of a brief introduction of your experience working with this uh, topic. Okay, Yosef, thanks for asking me to to dig into it. And um, as you said, this is really off the cuff. Um, so... I began working on uh, the serotonin system before we had SSRIs, and I prefer if people don't don't think back to how long ago that must have been. Um, uh, so I was the kind of person who got asked by the pharmaceutical companies to come and talk to doctors about the serotonin system. And I got an insight on what they were thinking about these drugs and other drugs uh, during that period. Um, and one of the interesting things that happened to me was very early on, I had two men who became suicidal on SSRIs. And uh, it was very clear that there was a combination of things going on in them, one of which we use the word akathisia, which is an awful word. It's the pharmaceutical company's friends, because when everybody hears about it, you know, at the wider public, politicians, the media, they have no idea what this is, okay? And the best description of it I have, I think, is emotional turmoil. Mm -hmm. And when... Um, when it appears first, it's back in, well, I mean, the word goes back over 100 years. There were people who had what was called akathisia, and it was an extraordinarily rare thing. But it becomes a very common thing once we actually get at the psychotropic drugs. And one of the drugs that, that really brought this home first was a drug called reserpine, which has been used to treat people who had hypertension. Now, it also uh, became used as a drug to treat people who are anxious, a drug to treat kids who are hyperactive, a drug to treat people who are depressed, and a drug to treat people who had psychosis. But the interesting thing was that people being treated with hypertension, of course, had no nervous problems at all. And they would say, I mean, the reporters saying when they're in treatment in places like the Mayo Clinic, good clinics, they're reported as saying, you know, the first few doses, I became very agitated. I began having thoughts that were very unusual for me, thoughts that included uh, things like, like homicide. Uh, and uh, it was only when I came off the drug that I realized it must have been the drug that did this. So that was there very early on uh, in uh, at the 1950s. The reason we know about it, and everybody agrees, resident does these things. It makes you depressed. It makes you suicidal. It makes you homicidal. Everybody agrees about that because this is a drug that was cheap and generic, and no pharmaceutical company had any interest to defend it. But when exactly the same things begin to happen on the later antipsychotics and the SSRIs we have now, of course, the pharmaceutical companies are making billions of dollars out of this, and they have every interest to defend the drug and tell people, no, our drug couldn't cause this. Um, and the other thing that comes to mind with reserpine as well, that makes it such a compelling case for a drug being able to cause severe turmoil is that it's being used initially in non-psychiatric patients at all. So there's no explaining this stuff away. These are people coming in with high blood pressure, I don't know, back in the 50s or something like that, who are becoming dysphoric, suicidal, potentially homicidal, and there's no, there's no way out of it. But, you know, like you said now, uh, you know, with people who are depressed, or, or you could always say, 
or maybe they flipped to mania. Maybe they became yeah, yeah. bipolar. Maybe, maybe this is some kind of psychotic illness which is emerging, and it becomes a lot easier to say prob- probably not the drug, even though we know for a basis that in rare circumstances, all drugs that have some kind of CNS effect may in rare circumstances uh, cause something like agitation, disinhibition, or violence. But before I want, before we go in there, I, I want to say this because you sell yourself short sometimes. Um, you know, Dr. David Healy here is, is, is the world expert on, I'd say, antidepressants and violence. He's probably very modest. I think out of anyone, he has done the most forensic cases on cases of suicide, you know, civil cases, cases of homicide. And he's been doing this for years. And I want people to know that because, you know, you're not just some guy. I mean, I, I, I really consider you to be the, um, I, I don't know anyone else that knows more about this stuff. So I, I want to plug you there on that. And, can go back to your comment now. Just quickly to add in yeah. to the point you made, which is extremely important, which is the people being treated mm. with this drug who had mm. hypertension did not have nervous illnesses that we can blame the effect on. The other thing, though, is in case people start thinking recipin is an awful drug which causes these awful problems, there were some people who reported being better than well on it. So it's exactly like the SSRIs. You've got some people on the one hand reporting being better than well and other people becoming homicidal. So, you know, the fact that the drug has worked for you or people you know doesn't mean that it can't cause these problems for some other people. And equally the other way around, when the drug causes problems for people, you don't want to say, well, this drug shouldn't be on the market because there likely are people who are being helped by it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's the nuance that has been completely lost in a lot of these behavioral side effect problems with the drugs. Uh, they clearly help some people, you know, they clearly reduce depression to a level that may help someone avoid suicide, but that doesn't mean in one in a thousand or whatever it is, because it's hard to estimate that someone's not going to have a paradoxical reaction that goes in the other direction. It makes them worse. And then when you aggregate data in a clinical trial and you look at the balance of these things, you know, it may disappear. I mean, in some cases it doesn't, but it, it's, they, they can have dual effects, uh, which is common for all drugs. You know, even antihypertensives can cause hypertension in some people. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. Um, if there was nothing more you wanted to kind of uh, say on, on Reserpin, I'd, I'd like to segue and ask you about how you've seen violence and violent acts emerge um, in patients on antidepressants. You know, what what do they look like? What do they describe? You know, what are the different ways it's manifested from, from your experience? Yeah. Let me take you through a few cases that um, that came to me and then cases that I came to. Um, the ones that came to me, there was a man who um, I put on Prozac. This was a guy who worked in a university job, very well placed man, very balanced man in loads of ways, goes on an SSRI and becomes suicidal. But the interesting thing about it was that he didn't just become suicidal. He had thoughts about driving his car on the motorway and the bit of road that I'm thinking of, that he was thinking of, didn't have the kind of barriers in the middle of the road. And he was thinking about uh, uh, committing suicide by veering his car over the road into the oncoming traffic. So this was going to kill other people uh, <clears throat> and himself. And the other man that came in, this was very early on after the SSRIs were on the market in the UK for only a few months. The other man who came to me uh, was a man who thought about trying to kill himself as well. Uh, but when you asked him about the thoughts about harming himself, they were terribly violent thoughts. This was not just take a few pills. This was reach down un, under the sink in at the kitchen where he was. And in the UK, you usually had a, a lead which was attached. This is an electric lead which was attached to the pipes under the sink, which earthed the power system uh, in the house. And he was going to take that and grab that and kind of electrocute himself. He was also getting out uh, serrated knives and really wanted to carve himself up in bits, you know. So these were very violent thoughts. Now, many, well, a few years after that, I got involved in a case called the Foresight case. And this was one in, 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 uh, in Hawaii. 
And William Forsyth, uh, and I think his wife's name was June. Uh, this is the kind of thing I'd have checked beforehand if I'd had a bit more time to go cool. through things. Yeah. Uh, she, he had um, he had become slightly unhappy in Hawaii, Maui. I mean, how you can become unhappy in Maui, I don't really know. But he had thought about moving back to California. Uh, and his wife really wasn't all that keen to move. But he'd become a bit agitated and a bit unsure about where he was going. This was a man who was very well placed, very wealthy, had no issues about money or anything like that, church going man, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And he went along to a doctor who put him on Prozac. And uh, within a few hours of going on Prozac, he was more agitated. He gets to the point where he says he needs to be in hospital, uh, which is a bit of a surprise. He goes to hospital and the hospital see a man who, from their point of view, looks reasonably normal and is on a great new treatment, Prozac, etc. This is just wonderful. <laughs> and uh, he's there agitating, getting more agitated day by day, pacing up and down, says he wants to leave the hospital. And the hospital can't see any reason to detain him. You know, he's on treatment. He doesn't look that bad. Internally, he's feeling awful, but he doesn't look that bad to them. And they figure they can't really, they can't really hang on to him. And he goes home where he multiply stabs his wife and then sets up a bunch of knives on a chair. I'm unsure how this is done because I haven't actually seen the pictures. Look, curiously, actually, you know, I probably have seen the pictures. When I got asked to get involved in this legal case, they gave me a bunch of documents. At the mm. top of the boxes was a bunch of photographs. And uh, I think I closed them very quickly. I think it was just too grim mm -hmm. to look at. But he'd fallen on a bunch of knives that he'd rigged up on a chair so that when he fell on them, they were going to pierce his chest and kill him. The policeman that came said he had never seen so much blood anywhere in his life, okay? So this is the kind of terribly agit agitated state of mind that people can get into. Um, there was a case shortly after that, actually happening around the same time, which was in Wyoming. Well, actually, Montana. Yes, no, Wyoming is where the case happened. Montana was where a man called Tim Tobin lived with um, his wife and their first daughter. And Tim's father-in-law, that's um, his wife's father, was a man called Don Shell, who was from Wyoming, Republican voting, you know, an oil man, tough hombre, who had no ill health ever, who, but who um, some years beforehand, about eight years beforehand or so, had had trouble going to sleep. And this was soon after Prozac came out. And there was a lot of hoopla about this wonderful, better than well pill that is going to make you the new man mm -hmm. and things like that. And he went on Prozac and it didn't suit him. Okay. Uh, he um, began to, to hallucinate on it. And he got so bad that he figured um, that he had to halt it. So he halted it after about two weeks and was fine enough. I mean, he was just fine enough that he had a very minor problem that was going to clear up quickly. So eight years later, he's having trouble going uh, to sleep again and calls, a lot, calls to uh, the family doctor's office that he'd gone to before, but there's a change of doctor. So he goes in and says, look, uh, I'm actually having trouble trying to sleep. And uh, the doctor gives him Paxil, not having the old records, not having met him before, not being aware that you know, the SSRI that he was about to give him might not be the drug for him. And he gave him some Ativan also. And 48 hours later, Don's daughter and granddaughter were visiting him and his wife, Rita. And Don shot Rita in the head, shot his daughter, Alyssa in the head, shot his granddaughter in the head, and shot himself. So a total wipeout. Tim was the only person not there. And when he called and there was no answer and things like that, came down to the house and had this very bad feeling when he got there and broke in and, you know, it was a grim kind of nightmare. His life was and, over, it sounds like, lost everyone he cared about. Yeah. yeah. Now, he... Hmm. Um, he took an action against 
GlaxoSmithKline. And, you know, Wyoming's a tough place. Uh, the joke around the time that it was uh, staunchly Republican with one raving liberal, Dick Cheney. Uh, so, you know, you don't expect a Wyoming jury to kind of give a man, uh, I mean, to, to come down, uh, sort of to blame a pharmaceutical company. They're much more inclined to blame a man for not having done the right thing. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, But a jury of lay people listening to uh, the pharmaceutical company saying, look, our drug has been approved by FDA. It has no problems that we know about. A jury of lay people did the right thing and held GlaxoSmithKline responsible for the homicide. And this, as far as I know, was the first time uh, a pharmaceutical company were held responsible for a behavioral event their drug had caused. Now, was this not the case in, in for the case in Hawaii that you saw? With, what, what happened there? Well, no, that was an extraordinary case, which was, um, I thought it was an awfully clear cut case. There was no way to explain it other than uh, the Prozac had caused it. But the jury decided it hadn't. And it turned out that um, the law firm representing uh, uh, the family applied for a retrial on the basis that there was one juror in the mix who told the rest of the jury that, you know, you aren't going to get out of here for months because I am never going to agree that the drug caused the problem. So essentially the jury collapsed. It was close to Easter. Everybody wanted to get home for the holiday and they said, mm. hey, uh, we can't blame the drug. But there was a retrial, which is called Forsyth 2, which GlaxoSmithKline resolved and paid a lot, not GlaxoSmithKline, Lily resolved and paid a good deal of money, partly because some of the evidence that had come out in the interim between the two trials was that Lily had filed for a patent on R fluoxetine, claiming it wouldn't cause the suicidal reactions and homicidal reactions that Prozac causes. Okay. So it was very hard for them to get out from under that, okay? But let me just quickly add one more thing in. Almost exactly the same time that the Tobin trial um, was happening, I was also involved in a case in New South Wales in Australia, Sydney. Mm -hmm. There was a man called David Hawkins. And he uh, and his wife had been living happily. They were reasonably old. He was early 70s, I think, and she was a few years younger. And he had gone along to... Uh, at the family doctor some years beforehand who uh, had give him, given him Zoloft. This was the SSRI that was number one over there. And he'd given him that. And David Hawkins had a very bad reaction to it and went back to the doctor who said, yes, clearly this drug does not suit you. Come off it, et cetera, et cetera. And he put a note in the medical record saying this man shouldn't be given any SSRIs ever again. And a few years later, David Hawkins uh, was again finding it hard to sleep, okay, and went to the family doctor who was on vacation. And there was a locum doctor there who said, hey, I'll give you a drug which is sure to help you. Now, I don't think, as I recall it, David Hawkins hadn't particularly registered the name of the drug that had caused him the problem in the first case and didn't realize he was now being given the same drug again. So he goes home and takes the drug, hoping he's going to have a good night's sleep and doesn't actually fall asleep quickly. So doubles the dose, maybe even takes a third dose. So, you know, he moves very quickly that evening from 50 milligrams to at least 100 milligrams, maybe 150 milligrams, remains agitated, stays up all night. And when his wife comes down in the morning, he kills her. He then gets in a car and drives off to kill himself he calls the police to let them know what's happened she's dead at home and i did it they're able to track him down and get hold of him before he kills himself so he ends up being charged with her murder and it's an interesting case because um it's one that i wrote a report on and uh what happened was the prosecutor the judge with the approval of the prosecutor, said this man would not have killed his wife 
but for the influence of the drug, and he was let walk free that day. Now, there's an interesting point here, I think, which is in the Tobin case, the jury, I think, may have been inclined to say, yeah, the company is actually responsible here because there was no one left alive to walk free from court. In the <laughs> Hawkins case, you have an old man who's <clears throat> let walk free from court. And you uh, the judge and and prosecutor thought, you know, the drug did this. What a jury would have thought about letting a man walk free is a bit unclear to me. But I think there is an issue. One of, one of the things that comes into play here is if a jury are faced with no one left alive, it's easy. It's easier for them to think the drug may have caused it. But if they're faced with the issue about letting someone who's killed someone else walk free from court, that's a more difficult call for them. It's like a higher burden, you know, of, of, of evidence needed. Um, you know, when I'm hearing all of these things, one thing I want to ask you is, I like, in a way, I feel like I can understand how someone could become violently suicidal on the drug to the point where they may, you know, stab themselves several times or attempt to take their life and in a horrific way, like you said, maybe grabbing the electrical outlet underneath the sink and, you know, harming themselves in that way. You have such intense inner dysphoria and agitation caused by the drug, you may already have some depression and it pushes you to a point where you say, I want to take my life in the most reliable way possible. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, take an overdose and just see what happens. I'm going to stab myself several times. I'm going to mutilate myself. So intense inner agitation to that level, it almost makes that self-harm more understandable, but killing your granddaughter or your wife or something like that. I was wondering, you know, when you've spoken to people who have done things like that, have you ever asked them about their mental state at the time, you know, what were you thinking when this happened? Yeah. And and how did they describe it? Is this some kind of psychotic type thing? Is do they have no recollection? Were they in a delirious haze? What what's your um experience with their mental state when they've harmed other people, especially those that they've loved? Yeah. I think you can get all of those things. You can get people who are uh, delirious and don't recall the thing afterwards. It may be that uh, you won't recall it afterwards because you've been co-prescribed a benzodiazepine because the pharmaceutical companies know their drugs can do this. And early on, they co-prescribed benzodiazepine. They told doctors to give your patient who's beginning an SSRI a benzodiazepine also. Now, one of the things we know is that the benzodiazepines in their own right can cause amnesia. If you kill someone, there's involved people can find it hard to remember just what happened if you're on a benzodiazepine as well that's going to be even harder okay but industry knew that these reactions were quite likely um you know so they've gone out of the way to try and ensure that they don't get left holding the can for the whole thing mm -hmm. um but you get quite aside from that again if you get people who go close to a violent action. What you get are reports like, you know, and I was there and I saw these kids trying to break into my car. And, uh, you know, I had a, an ax in my hand or whatever. And I thought about raising it to kill them. But I, I had a little bit of time to think and I was able to stop myself. Okay. But the point I'm trying to make here is when you're on, I mean, in the ordinary course events, you probably wouldn't even think about raising the axe to the kids. Or if you did, you didn't raise it, okay? What happens on a an SSRI is there's a certain loss of anxiety about the consequences of what you're about to do. And you can overcome that to some extent if you remember, I'm not the same as I normally am. I'm going to be a little disinhibited. I'm going to, I'm likely to do things that, that I might not otherwise do because I'm not as anxious as usual on these drugs. So I need to be thinking a bit more before I do things. Now, mm -hmm. there's people who get to that point and can be reasonably safe on the SSRI. Lots of us though can't, you know, we're, and, and at least early on until we've adjusted to the idea that maybe we need to do a bit of thinking here before we do anything odd or strange. Uh, you know, the drugs do numb you. So you can do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. They can do two things. One is they can give you thoughts you wouldn't otherwise have of harming your family. You know, 
Most of us don't have these thoughts. The drugs can give you these thoughts, but they can also numb you to the anxiety, the awful anxiety you might have if you did have some thoughts on your own accord about this kind of thing, you know, but you wouldn't do it because you're so anxious. But the drugs can take that a, a way so you're more disinhibited. Uh, and mm -hmm. the rest of the family can notice these things. You know, he's had a change of personality. That's, I mean, they can spot the change and maybe, um, maybe not be aware that this could be a risky change. It looks good in one sense. He's more relaxed. He's more mellow, but maybe it comes with risks. Yeah. And I think that's a really nice way to summarize it because, you know, when people hear about, oh, antidepressants may cause suicide or violence, I mean, it's kind of hard to really explain what that is. And and as you say, I think it's a spectrum. And that's been my experience, I guess, reading a lot of these case reports of people becoming manic or violent when I was at the FDA. Um, yeah, you could have, say, for instance, you have a person, no violent tendencies, not around a knife or, you know, a gun or anything. They have a severe reaction where they start having obsessive suicidal thoughts that come out of the blue and nothing happens. You could take that to, to the next person, you know, maybe they have some kind of violent thoughts sometimes, or maybe some suicidal thoughts. They have a severe reaction. Maybe they, but they have no access to a gun or, or anything like that. Maybe they harm themselves. Maybe they kind of punch a police officer or a nurse in the emergency room. They end up in a psychiatric unit, but then you could have, Someone else who has some violent tendencies, they have a severe reaction, but they have guns in the house. And then that just becomes a disaster. So it's kind of this mix of, you know, do they have some pre-existing thoughts? You know, are they, you know, do they have some aggression in there? You know, do they have access to means? How severe is the reaction? Um, and it's like a combination of these things from my perspective that leads to all these, these different outcomes. Um, yeah, let me add to that, which is this. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, yes, on these drugs, people can begin to hear voices, you know, which say to them, kill your neighbor or whatever. Uh, they can have beliefs where when you ask them about them afterwards, if they're able to recall it, can seem to you and me to be psychotic. But naturally, and I would figure if a person's mentally ill and they kill someone else, that they can't blame the illness. In almost all cases, they should be responsible for their actions. Trouble is, I think what we're dealing with here is not psychosis. What we're dealing with here is delirium. That you know, the patient, you know, the person is not themselves in the same way that they could be with a really high raging fever, fever, or withdrawal from alcohol, where you've got delirium tremens. And the courts, the legal system says, well, if you're delirious, you are not responsible for your actions. We cannot find you guilty if you're delirious. So this is a very important clinical uh, a distinction to make. Did this person describe psychosis to me or did they describe a delirium? Mm. And I, I suppose with the main features of delirium being uh, your mental state is altered to a degree where you know, if someone were to assess you or to look at you, they'd say, this guy, he doesn't really know who he is, what he's doing, you know, what is happening around him. He is he is so disordered, you know, from a mental perspective that we wouldn't hold him responsible for this. It's it's kind of this this severity of um yeah, the severity of the uh of the adverse reaction, you know. Sure. But crossing over to delirium. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But on this case, the thing is that uh, you know, the legal system and the medical system as well is very confused about this. When Marilyn Lamack, this very famous case from uh, uh, Chicago, killed her three children. This is a lady who was put on an SSRI and the dose was put up and up and up. She had, I mean, there was no way this was the lady that was ever going to kill her children or would ever have killed anyone. The dose was put up and up and up and she got worse. Every time you know, at, at the dose was put up, she got a bit worse. And she told her doctor, I mean, he had begun thinking she didn't need pills, just so that people know. But he said, well, hey, you've been under stress for a while. Let's just try Zoloft. And he kept putting the dose up. And every time she said she was worse, he put it up a bit further. And in the end, she killed her three children and tried to kill herself. Now, there's a very famous uh, Chicago trial, out of which she got a verdict uh, that she was guilty. This was murder. And the judge said, with some glee, I hope you go to jail and stay there for the rest of your life. And every single day, 
you hear your children asking you, why did you do this to us, mum? Okay. But the point I'm trying to make is that the defense for her and the prosecution were both operating on uh, the basis of, did she have a mental illness defense? And it was too easy for the prosecution to say, there was no hint of mental illness here. And the jury agreed with uh, the prosecution, and I agree with the prosecution. But the defense didn't know enough to think, well, there is another option other than uh, the fact that the drug, or that she had an illness. The drug she was on may have caused it. And, you know, in the case of the drug she was on, Zoloft, Pfizer had a healthy volunteer trial, which 18 years before this murder, they had women put on this drug and become suicidal and agitated, in one case, uh, aggressive. And Pfizer said, our drug can cause this. But none of that came into this lady's trial. So she ends up in jail. Yeah. I think something that might be helpful to talk about, uh, because I imagine maybe some of the listeners may have a question. It's kind of along the lines of like, how do you even know if a drug is caused this? You know, how how do doctors make this decision? How do juries and judges come up to it? And I'd, I'd like to provide some thoughts on it and then just kind of get your perspective. Uh, so, so most of this is pretty routine uh, drug safety science. So, you know, you would want to look for like a temporal relationship. So typically when someone starts a psychiatric drug, usually within the first couple of days to perhaps two weeks, that's, that's the high risk time. Now, that's not to say it can't happen afterwards. That's the highest risk time for someone to have an adverse behavioral reaction. It's also around dose change or dose drop if it happens in the weeks after that, that's, that's a high risk period. So, you know, you would consider something like that. You also want to consider like alternative explanations. And this is when you really need to do some research into what the person is like, you know, do do they have a history of violence? Do they have a history of suicide? Are there contextual stresses going on in, in this person's life that could account for what they have done? And if you can't find any of these things, and then you look at reports where they're being described by their therapists or their doctors as being so different from their baseline without an alternative explanation. That is, that's another key component of it. And then the other things you look at, you know, like David was saying a moment ago is, do these drugs have a history of causing similar things? You know, you could pull up a label of Prozac or Effexor and there's things like manic reactions, disinhibition, dysphoria, all these types of things where you could say, okay, that kind of makes sense. So for me, I mean, those those are kind of like the three main pillars that I think most people look at this from and maybe judges and juries. You know, well, I guess a defense attorney might, you know, make the case around. But what what else is in there in, in, in kind of from your perspective when you're teasing these things out? What are you looking for to say, you know, was this really the, cause, the causal factor in what happened? Yeah. What I'm doing is not a great deal different to what a member of the jury would be doing if they were faced with this on their own. And if the jury as a group of 12 people with completely different points of view were actually faced with this, which is just as you've outlined, you want to check if there's anything in the background. Was this a person who has been violent before or what we have reason to think was under some kind of stress, which might have caused them to be violent or whatever? Uh, You you know, it's good to know in a sense whether the drug has ever been reported to cause this before. But ideally, uh, what you'd want is, let's say uh, you've been treating me and I became violent or whatever, uh, but we halted the drug and the problem cleared up. And we both wrote it up as a case report to go into a journal, okay? Uh, And the journal published it where you're saying and I'm saying, yes, this drug seems to cause David Healy to uh, have become violent. And actually, just on that score, it's probably worth mentioning at some point before we finish, there's a lot of other drugs other than the SSRIs that can cause these kind of problems. Oh, drugs yeah. like asthma drugs that you wouldn't think of might be causing them, okay? Mm-hmm. But so, yeah, um, what happens is if we write these things up as a case report with your name on it and my name on it, the defense lawyer in a new case can bring us into court, to be examined and cross-examined about what we saw. And our credibility is going to be the kind of thing that will play a part in the jury trying to work out, well, is this other person who we think is reasonable, who's saying the drug caused them to behave this way, uh, is there, does their case get stronger because we've seen 
Dr. Whit During and Dr. Healy being examined, and they both seem credible also. There's, there's literally thousands of people, uh, thousands of reports of people becoming uh, homicidal on SSRIs, on FDA's website, and tens of thousands of people becoming suicidal on FDA's website. But because there's no names linked to that, it's all hearsay. It's not evidence. Nobody can bring these people into court so the jury can see just how credible it is based on the credibility of the people who say these things uh, actually happened to them. So the the um, in essence, we'd be going about the same kind of way as a jury would, and that might involve you taking me into a case conference with all of your colleagues, so they've got a chance to listen to the story as well and come to view and ask a bunch of other questions that you might not have thought about. But at the heart of the thing is, first of all, is the person likely to have done this without being on the drug? And the next thing is, when we increase the dose of the drug, do things get worse? When we reduce the dose and halt it, does it clear up? And after it clears up, if we reintroduce the drug, does it come back? Or if we give the drug with an antidote, is there less of a problem? These are all elements which bring you, uh, when you're a doctor trying to treat people, and a jury to say, well, on the balance of probabilities, the most likely explanation is the drug has caused it. Now, that doesn't sound like objectivity and, you know, really nailing it. Science really nails things down. That's not the case. Science operates on the balance of probabilities also, which is the probable way to explain the experiment happening in the apparatus uh, in front of me is, you know, the drug cause it or whatever, but I reserve the right to change my mind if we get new details. You know, if it comes out that this guy had an insurance policy, which meant if he killed his wife, he's going to get sure, lots of money. Yeah. If that turns up, then clearly that's going to change your mind. But it's scientific to come to a best possible view and to say, well, I'm not absolutely certain, but, you know, if there are more facts that turn up, then, you know, I reserve the right to change my mind. That's, that's a good summary. Um, you know, with, I think, I think with that in mind, you know, thinking about the science of cause and effect um, for behavioral problems, um, you've had one of the most unique experiences, I think, ever in, in being able to interview James Holmes. Um, now, this was the, the man who um, carried out the, I guess, the, 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 the infamous Aurora shooting in 2012. I think there was 12 people dead, several other injured, where he went into a movie theater with, um, I guess, some kind of um, costume on and just opened fire. Um, and there was a documentary made about this, a panorama one, I believe, that was aired in the UK, which is excellent. Um, it's kind of a little harder to find if you're in the US, but it's possible. And um, and David uh, actually got to interview James. So I, I think... You know, I'd love to hear about your experience, guys, I guess, getting pulled into one of the most high profile um, mass shooting cases ever and get your, well, I, I know it because I've seen the movie, but have you explain your, your perspective on the case and how you came to those conclusions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. The Holmes case was, as you say, really interesting. I, um, the legal team he had, which was the public defender team. This was not the most high-powered team around the place. You know, he did not have a wealthy lawyer. Or this was not a wealthy family. And um, they reached out to me, and I was happy to talk to them. And based on the bit they s said to me, uh, I didn't think there was a great likelihood that the drug had caused the problem. But they seemed to think that it had. Okay, And they were obviously operating from the basis they'd met the man, and the case didn't really make sense to them. Uh, they couldn't really understand what had happened. And one of the factors that they didn't know about was you know, the drugs. That's why they were reaching out to me. Okay, So um, uh, in the end, I agreed to go over and see him. Okay? And it became, I changed my view. I mean, I went into the room with him pretty skeptical. But I had a chance to interview him for an hour or two, and I'd had a chance to see all the medical records and reports from a bunch of other doctors who'd seen him 
previously, none of whom had any expertise with uh, at the drugs, none of whom seemed to have entertained the possibility that the Zoloft he was on could have caused the problem. So I went in and I was struck by the fact that he was a very normal human being. This was not a monster in the sense of someone who kills 12 other people and injures 72 others. You know, you think, well, this is a pretty monstrous kind of person. He, he was definitely not monstrous. He had begun on Zoloft because he was shy at university. So he had gone along. He was nervous making presentations. He was nervous about uh, trying to ask girls out. He'd gone along to the site psychiatrist on the university campus who had given him Zoloft and the benzodiazepine. Uh, mm. I think it was the benzodiazepine. And there may have been more than one drug that he was also given. But anyway, he comes back after a week or two and says he's not any better and says that, you know, he's cognitively not able to concentrate as well. And she figures it's the benzodiazepine, which of course can mean that people aren't able to remember things. But it's also a pill that is an antidote to the problems Zola can cause. She reduces that and increases the dose of uh, the Zoloft that he's on. So she's made the wrong call. I mean, this isn't a kind of crime, but she's made the wrong call. She doesn't know that she's made things worse. He comes back a few weeks later, and um, I think she, she may have introduced a, a different drug uh, to replace the benzodiazepine. But again, she makes the wrong call. You know, the next time around, she takes away the other drug, just leaving him on the Zoloft only. He, uh, now, she does this because he's again reported to her that he's not doing well. This is not a man who's had a good response to an SSRI. He hasn't come into her happy as a clam and things like that. What his What is happening, though, is behaviors changing. He's beginning to do things like he finds it easy to go and ask girls out. You know, he picks the prettiest girl in the class and asks her out. You know, this is the kind of behavior that just wasn't happening before. He's going uh, onto websites. He's beginning to buy things that, you know, he wouldn't have ever bought before, including in which is guns. And he goes along to a shooting range to teach himself how to shoot and things like this. This is all very unusual behavior for him. There's never been anything like this before. Okay, so he then goes back to the doctor who's beginning to get a bit worried about him and has an, uh, who has a colleague in with her when she sees him this time. And uh, she asks him how he is, and he says, look, I'm not much better. Uh, and he says, uh, if I was to tell you what I was thinking, you'd lock me up. And the response from both doctors was, well, you're responsible for the thoughts you have. If you do anything strange, you're going to be held responsible. Okay, and they let him walk out. I mean, he could have told them he had begun to keep a diary. He was talking about having a manic reaction, as he called it. Uh, he was talking about all the things that he was beginning to think about doing, shooting a bunch of people, okay? Uh, so these are the thoughts he was having that he put in his diary that they didn't think to pursue with him. Now, the other intriguing thing about the Holmes case is that I got a chance to interview his parents. And they didn't know he'd been an SSRI. They had no idea that the SSRI may have caused you know, the problems that he was on. It turns out that both of his parents at one point or another had had an SSRI and that they'd had reactions not unlike the ones that he'd had. Things became terribly vivid and abnormal to, uh, I think, his mom. And I forget the reaction um, that um, 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 his father had. The other thing that was interesting about him was he'd had an antihistamine that was a serotonin reuptake inhibiting antihistamine some years previously and had a very bad reaction to it. So we have a time bomb created and, uh, you know, um, the he finally comes off the SSRI because he runs out of pills. He drops out of college. I mean, he's on a course he loves. This is where he wants to be. He drops out of college, doesn't go back to the doctor when he runs out of pills, goes into abrupt withdrawal and uh, ends up 
shooting people in uh, you know uh, at the cinema now my view on it was that you know you can't be absolutely certain the drugs caused it but i think it's highly likely that the zoloft he was on and the withdrawal from it caused the problems the defense team didn't want to chase that argument in court because what you've got is a situation where I will be saying to the jury, to the court, not just about the case, but you realize there was a Pfizer document from some years before the drug comes to market saying this could happen. You realize that the articles on Zoloft, the Pfizer articles on Zoloft are ghost written. You realize that not even FDA has seen the data from the clinical trials on these drugs. So what you're asking a jury is terribly tricky. One was you are asking them to let a man after a horrific set of killings like this to walk free from court, which, you know, even he himself, I mean, one of the interesting things about people who do these things is they don't usually blame the drug. They blame themselves. It can take years in jail before you decide, you know, it really was that drug that did it. You know, people don't immediately want to go free because they blame a drug, you know, and they probably sense, you know, a man like James Holmes, if he was to walk out of court, that he'd be torn apart. You know, the relatives that were left afterwards of the dead and the injured would have tried to kill him. You know, <laughs> uh, it's a weird world to be in. But the other thing was the jury, whatever about them saying, yeah, it looks like the drug caused it, don't want to face up to the fact that the system has been hiding things from James Holmes' doctors and the rest of us that we all should know about if we're going to use these drugs reasonably safely. The jury is being asked to contemplate the fact not only did a drug cause this, but the FDA and all sorts of good people have not been behaving responsibly. They're part of the problem. You know, in a sense, the jury is, it would be asked to find FDA partly guilty also, and also Pfizer. Now, um, it isn't a thing you can ask a jury to do easily. And I mean, the other thing that comes to mind is who would want to be on the jury that acquitted James Holmes? I mean, sure. living in that town when people know, like, so it's almost like the pressure sure. of it. I mean, the it's like the standard is so high. And and and, and I guess they eventually went for a um, not guilty by reason of insanity defense, correct? Wow. Right? Let me, yeah, let yeah. me pick up on that and say something that I don't have the real answers to. I mean, the complete answer to, which is the defense team <clears throat> were convinced the drug did it. And particularly when I came back to them and said, you know what, I've just been to see this man and I think the drug did it. Okay. They had a strong card in their hand, but they didn't want to play it. My sense is, again, they'd have felt a bit like uh, you're the jury. If they'd been the defense team that got him free, maybe they wouldn't have looked all that good. But also, my hunch is they did a deal with the prosecution, who didn't want the whole idea about, you know, the medical literature just goes threatened, there's no access to the data and things like that. And Pfizer knew that these things could happen, didn't want that to come into uh, the public domain either. So... Uh, you know, I can't prove this, but my, I mean, they did, as you say, play uh, the mental illness card. He did not have a mental illness. This man was no more mentally ill than you or me. He was more introverted than you and me. He was shyer than you and me. He was more anxious than you and me, but he's a young college student, you know, but he didn't have a mental illness. And it looked implausible to the jury when that card was played. If I was on the jury, I wouldn't have believed it. But they managed to get one juror to say, and this is probably helped by the prosecution will be my hunch, to say that, yeah, he might have had a mental illness, which meant he didn't get the death penalty, but he's in jail for 3,500 years instead. I want, I want to... Um... I want to show some photos because I'm, I'm going to sh I'm going to share my screen at the moment, and you know what what you described. I mean, it sounds like a kind of a manic reaction. And when you look at these photos taken of him, and sure, you know they may just, you know that this may be a chance yeah. occurrence, but you you look at the you know this is armchair psychiatry for me. But he's wide eyed. I mean, he's dyed his hair like bright orange. I mean, this yeah. is like a shy, introverted guy. And mm -hmm. you're having all of these pretty, um, 
I mean, it just something about it just to me just looks like disinhibition and mania totally. when you say Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And he used the word mania, but I think you're looking at a form of delirium agitation, which in which he was more overactive, doing more, and you could have said he was bipolar, but this was not a bipolar disorder. Yeah. Well, David, at, at the point at the point yeah. that I saw him, Joe, he, you know, he'd been off these. Well, actually, one of the other interesting things about the case was um, they introduced an SSRI again when he was in jail. He'd been off it for months. He was very subdued. They introduced an SSRI, and he became agitated and tried to kill himself. Yeah, so, I know. didn't know that detail of the yeah. case. That's that's really interesting. Well, well, David, we've been we've been going at it for a while now. Um, so it's pr probably a good time, good time to wrap. Um, so, uh, is there is there anything else that you wanted to to add before we wrap up? Only this. I mean, I think it, and it is a key point. The idea of becoming violent on these drugs is among the trickiest problems there is. You know, people can accept if you take a drug and you have a problem, an injury to you. Yeah, okay, that's what happens with drugs. But third parties innocent parties who aren't on the drug ending up dead because of a drug I'm taking or you're taking is one of the wildest things we have in medicine. And it's not just the SSRIs. Some antibiotics can cause it. Some asthma drugs can cause it. There's a range of other drugs that can cause these, these things. So my, so the key take home message is if you go on any drug and feel weird, you're probably right. Now, the world we live in is one where you'll be told, don't come off your drugs, whether it's even an asthma drug or whatever. Don't come off your drugs without consulting your doctor. That's not safe anymore. If you've got a good doctor, it may work. But all too often, doctors will increase the dose of the drug you're on when you say you feel weird. Yeah, yeah, that's. I think it's something that everyone should be counseled uh, on whenever they take one of those drugs that you just mentioned. You know, there's a rare chance this is going to make you worse. And if it does, do not double the dose. You know, stop it and come in to see me again. I mean, um, I do want to say, you know, although I've never actually worked on a case of homicide, I have reviewed, you know, thousands of these case of cases of mania and paranoia with atomoxetine. I mean, that was something that I did uh, mm -hmm. at the FDA. And the amount of reports I read of people becoming acutely paranoid and aggressive. I mean, none of them resulted in a homicide or anything like that, but it's like a spectrum. You know, if you're, if you're seeing yeah. people who are harming others in, in these states of paranoia, it seems only logical that, you know, push to the extreme, you know, these outlier cases that it's possible. Um, and I guess the I other mean, point. Mm -hmm. And into that, I mean, yes, atomoxidine, as loads of people will know, is used for ADHD. The drugs that are mostly used for ADHD, though, are uh, the stimulant group of drugs, which became controlled drugs in the late 60s, early 70s, because of the violence they caused. We're now handing these things out liberally, and they are linked to people committing violence and killing other people. It happens. They can be great drugs for some people. They can cause problems for others. Yeah, the, the, the stimulants like the Vyvanse and the Adderall and all of that, I think it was in the early... 2000s that they got the class-wide black box warning and it's just like can cause mania and aggression you know right there in the box um mm -hmm. so that's a, it's a bit of a hard you know that's i feel like that's kind of easier because you have the fda um there but when it comes to things like antidepressants there's nothing there that really says like aggression violence homicide or anything like that there's things like disinhibition mania you know agitation you kind of have to piece it together but there's not that same kind of warning um the other thing I wanted to say is just because this case, you know, from David's evaluation, you know, looks like a drug may have played a role, you know, it's really hard to speculate on other cases of mass shootings because unless you've actually kind of know what happened and you know the behind the scene details, what was this person like? What was going on in their life? It's just speculation there, you know, and, and these things clearly I think they can happen without any drug involvement. And so it's 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 hard to know unless you really know the details. So you probably want to hold off just saying all of these things are caused by um, by medications. It's you, you can't really come to that conclusion without knowing further details. 
No, that's the, that's key. You need to know uh, the details of uh, the case and ideally get to interview uh, the person uh, if they are the person who did the killing. And James Holmes is unique from that point of view. He's a person who remained alive afterwards, so he could mm. be interviewed. And one of the weird things about it was some very good clinical doctors interviewed him and didn't make a possible link to uh, you know, the pills. I mean, it's, it's you know, if they'd even said, well, look, there's all sorts of things. He could have had a mental illness. It could have been the pills. They didn't. They didn't even entertain the possibility it could be the pills. They didn't ask the questions that would let them say, no, it's not the pills. How do you yeah. explain the orange hair? You know, it's <laughs> like it's um, OK. Well, I think that's a wrap for today. David, thank you so much for coming on again. Um, you're very popular on this channel. You know, your, pr your prior interview did well, so. I'm, I'm probably going to be asking you again to come on. I mean, you've got such a vast knowledge of things and, and I just think it's great. So I want to just say thank you again for doing this. And uh, uh, I guess uh, hope to see you uh, on this again soon. Right, Joseph. Thanks very much for asking me. We seem to be able to chat reasonably freely, which I hope means that uh, anyone who tunes in will find it halfway interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. All right. Great, okay. David. You have a great day. Thank you. Right. See you. Bye.